rethink any content that you're creating around some key questions. Firstly, is this the sort of thing that my customers would actually want to read? This will save you loads and loads of time. So many businesses are churning out content which is just utter garbage because nobody really cares. Either it's completely focused on themselves or it's about topics that nobody really cares about or it's written in a way that people will just never click on it. So think, is this engaging? Are you, is it the sort of thing that people will actually want to click on? If they do click on it, is it informative? Is it actually gonna improve their perception of your business because it gives them information? Is it shareable? Is this the sort of thing that people might want to share because they've got value from it? And finally, is this the sort of thing that other websites might like to post? Now, if it's none of those things, then it's probably a waste of time. Getting to a milestone of 100 leads per day is a big deal for any business. And in this video, we're gonna share the tips that we've used to help our clients get to this historic milestone. Firstly, you might be watching this thinking, 100 leads a day, Tim, I'd be happy if we can get to 20. Well, here's the thing. In order to get to 100 leads per day, you need to have proven traffic channels and you need to have a very compelling lead generation strategy, some kind of bait that you're offering people in order to get them to submit their details to become a lead. So the work that you have to do to get yourself ready to get to 100 leads per day means that you'll progress faster in your lead generation goals. So let's go. Now, most businesses that are struggling to get leads went through a very similar process to what we at Exposure Ninja went through in the early days of our agency. Namely, they have a website and their main way of getting leads is through the Contact Us page. So they just hope that people will find their website through social media or search click on it, read through the site and think, oh, this looks great. And then go to the contact us page and fill in an inquiry. We did this too in the early days of Exposure Ninja. And the good news is that some people will fill an inquiry form out. They will go and hunt out your contact us page and fill in that contact form. The bad news is that most people won't. If you really want to improve your lead generation, you need some kind of compelling call to action, which means that people are more attracted. They're more likely to become a lead because they're getting something in return. So in this video we're going to talk about firstly the foundations that you need in place in order to embark on your journey to 100 leads per day then we're going to talk about your call to action and conversion rate then we're going to talk about the different traffic channels that you can use to drive those leads now what this video isn't is click this button click this button on Facebook and ping you'll get 100 leads because the source of your leads will depend on your business and who you're selling to so what we'll do instead is we'll be talking about the broad strategic approach that you need to take and some of the things to keep in mind mind across different traffic channels which you can use to generate more leads. Okay, so let's talk about the foundations that you need in place. Now, any business that's seeking to generate 100 leads per day is going to need a high converting website, i.e. a website that is efficient at turning traffic into leads, and they're going to need a lot of traffic to the site as well. So these two elements need to be in place if you're going to get to 100 leads a day without spending millions on traffic per month. But you don't get to that place overnight. You get to that place through testing and measuring and trying different things. And if you're gonna be testing and measuring and trying different things, you need a framework in place that allows you to identify what's working and what isn't so that you can do more of the stuff that is working and less of the stuff that isn't working. Now, any business that's generating 100 leads a day has a high converting website and is plowing a lot of traffic at that website. In order to get to the stage where you're confident to put a lot of budget behind paid media or organic traffic, you need to first know exactly what's happening on your website and you need to be very tuned to how people are using your site. This will help you optimize your site for conversions and also give you the confidence to put the budget behind traffic that you're going to need to to get to this milestone. Tip number one is to have conversion tracking set up in Google Analytics. This is really simple. When someone lands on your website, you need to see in Google Analytics when they fill in your inquiry form or your call to action, whatever the thing is that you're asking people to do, whether it's clicking on a phone call or whatever, you need to know when someone lands on your site, what they're doing, the pages that they're going through in order to convert. And Google Analytics allows us to do this. Now, I'm not gonna go into the detail of how to set up conversion tracking inside Google Analytics. It's pretty basic. Hopefully you've already done it. If not, we do have videos on on Google Analytics that you can check out, link there. Tip two is landing page optimization. Now this is not a one and done thing where you just optimize your landing page and now it's ready for loads of traffic. Now landing page optimization is not a one and done activity, it's a constant process, it's a mindset really. Because any page that you're driving a lot of traffic to, you're constantly gonna be needing to test the calls to action, the headings, the words, the 
copy, the images on the site and things like this. We've got other videos which break this down in more detail, so I'm not gonna go into loads of detail on this. You can check out our landing page optimization video there. Okay, tip number three is to make sure that you've got heat mapping installed. We love using Hotjar. It allows you to see how people are using the site in three main ways. Firstly, you can see where people are clicking on the page. This is really useful because if they're clicking on a particular word or a heading, that shows that there's intent behind that heading. They want to find out more about that thing. They're clicking on areas that aren't buttons and that tells you that either they need more information or the user interface isn't particularly clear. Hotjar also shows you scroll depth, so how far someone is scrolling down the page. Again, this is really useful because it tells you how engaging your pages are and how much information people are requiring in order to convert. The third thing that Hotjar shows us is individual user recordings. Now this is really insightful, but also maddening as you're actually watching people use the site, move the cursor around, go through different pages, and then either convert or not convert. Now spending some time looking at user recordings in Hotjar, it's a really valuable, if geeky, use of your time because it helps you to understand how real people are using your website. Okay, so once you've got those three things in place, i.e. you're tracking conversions, you've taken the landing page optimization mindset forward with you, and you've got heat mapping installed so you can see where people are clicking, how far they're scrolling, and what they're doing on your site, now you're ready to start thinking about traffic. Now, the first traffic source that we're gonna talk about today is pay-per-click advertising. Once you've got a well-optimized site, you're pretty confident with your offering and you're ready to start driving traffic, then pay-per-click is a natural step to take. Pay-per-click advertising refers to any advertising where you're paying to get people to click on your ad and come to your website. Now, there's lots of different ways of advertising with pay-per-click and the two most common are Google's advertising products and Facebook's advertising products, which includes things like Instagram ads, Facebook Messenger ads, and of course, advertising on Facebook news feeds. Now, why is pay-per-click an important source of leads? Well, basically because it's extremely scalable. Whether your business suits Google or Facebook, and we'll talk about the differences in just a second, being able to just crank up your ad spend and get more traffic on your site very quickly is a really scalable way of getting leads. Once you find an approach that works, you can just turn it up really easily. Whilst organic traffic approaches like SEO are fantastic and the volume of leads that they can generate is amazing, there can be a lag between putting the work in and getting the results. And it's much less predictable because you're working against visibility algorithms. Whereas with pay-per-click, once you've got an established cost per lead, you can then make a very rational, clear decision to say, do we want to scale this? How much do we want to scale this? And you can watch that cost per lead number change over time. Okay, that brings us nicely to tip number four, which is choosing the right pay-per-click platform for you. The the central advertising product in Google's world is obviously search ads, so appearing when somebody's searching on Google in the little ads at the top and the bottom of the page. This is fantastic for businesses that are intent driven, i.e. I need a locksmith, I need a personal injury solicitor, I need an accountant. Now these are search intent businesses. Someone has to want the thing. Nobody just wakes up and thinks, ah, do you know what, I want a locksmith today. A locksmith isn't an impulse purchase, right? You don't just scroll through Facebook, see an, an advertiser for a locksmith and go, do you know what? We do need a locksmith, let's get one. But this is something that people search for. So if your business is primarily search focused, then Google search ads can make a lot of sense for you. Whereas if your business sells to a particular audience that is identifiable by their interests or their behavioral characteristics, and it's more of an impulse purchase, for example, you're selling fitness clothing, then this is the sort of thing that can work much better in display ads targeting particular audiences. And Facebook is often the display ad network of choice because it allows very, very very refined targeting options around people's interests, their behaviors as well. So broadly speaking, we tend to find that either Google or Facebook will be more profitable for a business. And the choice of those obviously comes down to whether you're intent based or whether it's more of an impulse purchase. Now, of course, we will run a lot of remarketing ads on Facebook for an intent based search on Google, but that's beyond the scope of this video. We'll save that for another day. So tip number four is to choose between Google and Facebook and put most of your attention into one of those to begin with. Splitting your time between them until one of these channels is working really well for you can just mean that you're spread too thinly. So focus on one to begin with unless you've got professional help. And by the way, if you want some professional help running this sort of thing for your business, then request a free website and marketing review from Exposure Ninja, link in the comments. Now tip number five is if you've chosen Google as your ad platform of choice, then you're probably gonna want to do some competitor spying. So I'm just gonna do a quick demo for you to show how we would spy on a very surface level on some of our competitors to see what sorts of lead generation strategies are working for them. Now I've just run a search here, Architects Surrey, and we've got four ads up at the top, which tells us this is a highly commercial search. 
So some of the things that I'm looking for when I'm analyzing these ads that we're seeing here is what are the differentiation statements? How are these businesses differentiating from each other? And is there any one which I'm particularly drawn to because they've got a killer USP or something about them that attracts me? The second thing I'm looking for is what sort of call to action are they offering and how are they positioning this in their ad? Because if they've got a very compelling call to action, for example, a free quote or a free 3D mock-up if I'm searching for architects, that tells me that they've thought about their sales route and they've actually got something which could be quite scalable. So let's have a look and see exactly what we've got. So the first ad here says Architects in Surrey award-winning designs. So award-winning designs they've decided is their USP, the thing that people really identify with. Uh, so what have we got here? Award-winning architects based in Wimbledon, new homes, renovations and extensions, call now. So call now is a weak call to action. It's better than nothing, but call now for what? What's gonna happen? What's the next step of the process? What's the incentive for me to call you? So it's okay, it will generate some leads, but it won't be as strong as something which is offering a more tangible and clearly defined call to action, which has a benefit to me as a customer. So this next one is Bark. This is a lead generation business. They will be generating hundreds of leads a day and their USP or their differentiation statement here is prices to suit all budgets. Uh, find recommended architects near you fast with Bark. Let us do all the legwork free. Okay, so that is their kind of call to action. Let us find them for you. Experienced designers, concept completion, extensions, home renovations. It's not a fantastic ad. It does give the different types of projects that they run, but they don't have a clearly defined call to action other than find someone near you, let us do all the legwork. Now here's one that does have a defined call to action. Up to five free quotes from top rated house architectural designers near you today will match you with the best architectural designer for your budget and project, all budgets. Okay, this is actually a pretty good ad. It tells us exactly what we're gonna get and it clearly differentiates us against the others by saying we're gonna give you five free quotes. Here's another lead generation business, Local Architects Direct. We'll give you the full contact details of registered architects so you can speak directly. Listing service for architects, architectural technologists, and interior designers. Now it's an extremely bland ad. It could go along the free quotes route, but it hasn't. So there's not really too much about this, which is massively compelling and it's all focused on price. Also, it's not really giving us anything I can't find in here. It's saying, well, we're gonna give you the full contact details of registered architects, which is exactly what I'm getting on this page. So they're not thinking about what they're competing with on the page. So the undoubted winner for me here is this house ad with their up to five free quotes from top rated house architectural designers near you today. The fact that it mentions all budgets as well. Tip number six, whether you're using Google or Facebook is to write multiple versions of your ad copy. You don't necessarily know which phrases and which words words are gonna resonate with your target audience, but all of these platforms allow us to split test ad copy very, very easily. So the first thing I would do is talk to your customers and find out what are the phrases, how do you describe what we do? This will allow you to write some ad copy which actually uses the language that your target customers are using, which is always a good idea. You can then write different variations of this and split test them against each other. Now, one of the things that you need to be careful with when you're split testing ads is you don't necessarily want the ad that generates the highest click-through rate because if it's really appealing and very broadly targeted, you'll get a lot of people clicking on your ad, but not necessarily converting. Every time someone clicks on your ad, you pay with pay-per-click. So that's okay if they're converting, but what you don't want is a lot of low quality traffic. So what you actually want to do is find the ad copy, which gives you the best cost per acquisition or cost per lead. This is gonna be the ad copy that you want to move forward with, even if it has a lower click-through rate than other ad copy. Okay, tip number seven is if you've decided that Facebook ads is your route, well, you can do some spying yourself as well. So there's a couple of different ways that you can spy on your Facebook ad competitors. The first way is to go to facebookads.com forward slash library and you'll see this page. This allows you to search for any business that's running ads and you'll be able to see the ads that they're running uh, when they started. There is a simpler way of getting to this though, and, and that is by using the eBoost Ad Spy Chrome extension. Now the eBoost Ad Spy Chrome plugin allows you to see any Facebook ads that are running for a particular business when you're on their website. So here we are on the Zero website and you can see here the ads extension has gone blue which means it's found some Facebook ads for this business. So if I click on that we will then go straight to the Facebook ad library for this business and we can see all of the ads that this business is running. Now what you don't see from this is which audiences they're targeting and really with Facebook that is 
like 50% of the game is the audience that you're targeting and the rest is what's in the ad and the offer that's being made. So we don't get to see the audiences that are being targeted, but what we do get to see is the offer that they're making, the copy that they're using and the imagery and that type of thing. So anytime you're gonna be running some Facebook ads for your business, you want to have a look at your competitors and see what they're doing, particularly if they've got ads that have been running a long time. If they've got ads that have been running a long time, that might mean that these ads are working very well for them. Whereas if you can see that they're chopping and changing and starting lots of different ads all the time, that might mean that they haven't yet found their angle. So what do we learn from Zero? Now, obviously Zero is a business that's gonna be generating hundreds, if not thousands of leads a day. We can see that they're running ads to drive people to webinars. So this is informational content. They're not necessarily driving people to sign up for Zero now. They seem to be um, advertising to get people into webinars and to get people to sign up for different informational things. And in fact, webinars seems to be the main way that they're advertising. Now, this is really interesting. This could imply that they're not actually driving people straight to Zero to sign up. These could be ads that are running to people that are already on Zero to get them more engaged and to get them to potentially upgrade their accounts. Or it could be that they're running these ads to people that have been on the Zero website. And these are retargeting ads designed to bring those people back onto the site, get them to submit their details as a webinar registrant so that they can advertise to them through email marketing and get them to sign up later on. Okay, tip number eight is to use the information that you've gathered from your spying campaigns very sensibly. What we don't necessarily want to do is just copy your competitors directly. You really want to elevate yourself above them so that you can afford to spend more on ads because you're doing better stuff and you're getting a higher conversion rate. So what we like to try and do is take the best elements from each competitor, but also if you see that your competitors are doing a poor job of their ads, they're not offering clear calls to action. It doesn't look like they're targeting the right keywords in their Google ads, or they're not using particularly compelling ad copy. This is a really, really good sign. And that tells you that either they're dumb and they're just pouring money down the drain, or they're making it pay but without being ruthlessly optimized, which gives you a lot of confidence that when you're running a very sensible and, and intelligent ad campaign, you'll be able to get a much better ROI. But really the benchmark that you want to set is you want to be running better ads than your competitors. You don't want to be a poor imitation. You have to be at least as good if you want the cost per acquisition that your competitors are getting. Okay, tip number nine is once you've got your ads running, your job is not done. A great ad campaign is not designed, it's optimized. Any ad campaign that we run at Expo Ninja, the cost per acquisition that we get in month one, we're looking to reduce that significantly over the first six, 12, even 18 months of the campaign. Ad optimization, whether you're on Google or Facebook, is absolutely key to running a profitable campaign. Ad campaign optimization is absolutely key to running a profitable campaign. Now we have videos which talk in more detail about this, but broadly the things that you're gonna be looking at, firstly with the Google ad campaign, you're gonna be running through what's called search query reports. These are the lists of keywords that have triggered your ads. You're gonna be looking through these every so often, every day if you're driving decent budget. Now you might look through these every day or every couple of days just to see which phrases have brought up your ad. Anything that's really not relevant to your business or over time you notice isn't converting, you're gonna to add to your negative keyword list. You're also gonna be split testing your ad copy and this is gonna be something that you're gonna be doing on Facebook as well. Split testing ad copy, setting up new variants, trying different creative to see what gets you the best cost per acquisition. You'll probably find that when you change your ad creative you immediately get an improvement in your cost per acquisition and you think great we're really onto something here we're home and dry only to find out that actually once those ads hit saturation performance drops a little bit so you need to be constantly refining constantly testing new things so on Facebook for example you might break down your audience by age group and notice that you've been driving a lot of traffic from younger age groups which really isn't converting so what you can then do is filter those out from the audience that you're targeting which will mean that obviously you get a better cost per acquisition, you get a more productive campaign. So just remember, a great ad campaign is not written, it is optimized and it will take time. And another remember is whichever channel you're running, think of optimization in terms of months, not days. Yes, you're gonna be optimizing every couple of days. And another optimization tip is to give your changes time to embed. So if you're running say 10, 15, 20 pounds a day, you're gonna obviously need to give your ads longer to get the data through than if you're putting in one to 10K a day. So your optimization frequency is 
going to depend on your ad spend and you want to make sure you're giving your ads enough time to get accurate data and before jumping to conclusions and chopping and changing things before they've had time to actually work. Okay, let's talk about remarketing and retargeting for a second. Now, the data shows that a returning visitor to your website is 43% more likely to convert than a cold visitor, i.e. someone who's never been to your site before. And for a lot of our clients, we'll run retargeting and remarketing campaigns, which are basically when we advertise to people who have already been on the site in order to get them back onto the site, particularly if they didn't convert the first time. Now, again, there are really two big choices with remarketing and retargeting. That is the Google Display Network, which will see your ads appear on Google or any sites that use Google AdSense. Or you have the Facebook Display Network, which can include things like Facebook news feeds, but also Instagram ads. Or you have Facebook retargeting, which will show your ads across Facebook's ad platform. Now, your choice between Google Display Network and Facebook ads isn't as straightforward here. And what you really want to do is think about the mindset that your customer Customer is in when they purchase from you. So for example, if you're selling something really serious and this is something that people would buy at work, then running retargeting ads on Instagram, for example, might not be the one because when your customers are scrolling Instagram, they're not really in that mode. So we want to think about the mindset that people are at when we want them to convert and make sure our remarketing or retargeting ads are showing to them at that point. All right, let's talk about SEO. Now we talked about the benefits of pay-per-click for scalable, fast, predictable traffic. But of course, SEO has massive benefits for lead generation and all of our most prolific lead generation clients have had a large component of their digital marketing focused on SEO because the traffic volumes that you can generate from SEO are so large. Now with SEO, we'll often use a renting a house versus buying a house analogy. With pay-per-click, you're essentially renting space at the top of search results. And as soon as you stop paying, you get evicted. Whereas with SEO, once you have prominent visibility at the top of search, there is nothing to pay and you're not going to get evicted unless Google takes a dislike to you through an algorithmic update or your competitors just bury you with better SEO. So you tend to be much more set with SEO than you are with something like pay-per-click where you obviously have to continue paying in order to appear. Tip number 12 is if you're using SEO for your lead generation, you want to start with keyword research. Now we've got videos all about how to find the best keywords for your business, but broadly speaking, we want to identify the phrases that our potential customers are using to find us. And this is really important. It's such a basic thing for SEO that it's often very tempting to just skip over it. But actually thinking about the language that your customers are using and the specific phrases they're using when they're ready to buy something like what you sell is really important. And again, this is one of those digital marketing tasks that is never finished. You never have your complete list of keywords and you never need to revisit this again. So we'd suggest always constantly talking to your customers, speaking with your sales team, finding out what's the language that your customers are using using when they're looking for us and continually revisiting your keywords that you're targeting both in your copy on your page, but also in your on-site optimization. Which in a super smooth segue takes us to tip number 13, which is optimizing your page titles and meta descriptions. Now word for word, your page titles and meta descriptions are some of the most impactful pieces of SEO that you can do with your site. Because for example, they show up in Google search. When someone searches, and I've got this search here, Architect Surrey, we can see this is the page title that this particular page is using and this is the meta description. Now the use of keywords in that page title has an impact on where this page is gonna rank. So for example, I've searched for Architect Surrey, the page title is Surrey Architects, which is a pretty good match. Um, so that has impact there. The meta description impacts how likely I am to click on this particular listing, because if this doesn't really sound relevant or it doesn't sound massively enticing, I'm gonna be less likely to click on it. And obviously if I'm less likely to click on it, then I'm gonna be less likely to become a lead for this business. But there's a secondary benefit there where if Google notices that lots of people are clicking on this page over time versus some of these others, then it's gonna infer that there is greater relevance to this page and that page then might enjoy some ranking improvement as well. So your page titles are meta descriptions are really, really important. Let's have a look at where they're set on the page. Now, for most businesses with WordPress websites, you'll be using a plugin like Yoast to set your page titles or meta descriptions. You can see the page title and meta description for any website by just going view source and looking for this section here, which is the page title. And then the meta description, if you can't find it, then you can just do a quick control F, go for description. And uh, you've got a few different versions here. You've got this bit, which is the meta description. 
that section there. Then you've got this one, which is the OG description, which is open graph description. This is the kind of meta description that you'll see when someone shares your site on Facebook, for example. You get that little bit of text that's about the page and that's where that is uh, populated from. So you wanna set a unique and relevant page title and meta description for every single page on your site. And these should be perfectly suited to that particular page. Don't use generic page titles and meta descriptions across your site because what's relevant for one page, the particular keywords and intent that's relevant for one page usually won't be the particular keywords and intent that's relevant for another page. So these need to be unique and tailored. Think of them almost like adverts for that particular page on your site. Okay, the next step is optimize the pages on your site for the keywords that you want them to rank for. This sounds obvious, most people don't do it. So for example, this page here um, is the Surrey page for this architectural practice. So this page is all about Surrey architecture, right? So what they really should do is here, instead of saying just Surrey, because this page isn't about Surrey, it's about architects in Surrey. Now luckily they've optimized their H1 to include the phrase Surrey architects, so that tells Google and tells visitors that, hey, this page is all about Surrey architects. You'll notice also that this page refers to Surrey multiple times and uses the phrase Surrey Architects. Now what you don't need to do is stuff your page full of unnecessary and unnatural feeling keyword repetition. You don't need to talk about Surrey Architects in every sentence, but it is a good idea to include the keywords that you're trying to rank for in a natural and sensible way, just as any great salesperson would. If you've ever spoken to a good salesperson, then the language that you use to describe what you're looking for, they will then use throughout the conversation. If you go into a car dealership and say, we're looking for a car to fit our three-year-old in the back, so we want lots of space, the salesperson will then throughout the conversation say things like, well, you want to check out this car because it's got loads of space for your three-year-old because they're just mirroring us. They're just telling us what we're looking for and they're applying it to their product. So we want to take exactly the same approach with the copy on our page and that's how we want to approach our keyword usage. Okay, tip number 15 is to add blog content on your site. Now, you don't want to fall into the trap that a lot of people People fall into when they're writing blogs, which is just to talk about themselves or talk about their business or latest news. This stuff is rubbish and nobody really cares. What you want to do instead is identify the questions that people would have about your product or your service, the thing that you're offering at different stages of the buyer journey, particularly at the top of the funnel when they're in the research phase. And you want to write blog posts which cater to those questions, answering them in detail. This will get you ranking for those questions. And these questions are the things that people tend to ask before they become a customer, before they buy something. So it's a great way of getting that top of funnel traffic that's maybe not ready to make a purchase yet, but you can then offer them something in your blog post in order to incentivize them to give you their email address so that you can follow up with them later on. Pro tip, getting blog post ranking and then retargeting that traffic with a commercial offer can be a great double strategy. Okay, tip number 16 is reduce your page load speed. Page load speed has a measurable impact on conversions. We have a separate video all about Core Web Vitals, which gives you a bit more insight into this, but also page load speed will become more and more of an important ranking factor over time. So it's a great idea to make sure that your pages are loading snappy. Okay, you're doing really well, stick with us. We're gonna be talking about some content marketing. Now content marketing is a great kind of addition to an SEO campaign because it helps to build authority for your website, helps you to build links, but also helps you to get in front of your target audience. Whether you're using digital PR, you're using outreach, you're using inbound journalist requests, getting your business featured on other websites around the internet is a great way of getting more customers. We've got loads of more in-depth videos, so I'm gonna be giving you a few. <laughs> We've got loads of more in-depth videos about every element of content marketing, but here I'm gonna be giving you a few quick fire tips to get you started. Tip number 17 is to rethink any content that you're creating around some key questions. Firstly, is this the sort of thing that my customers would actually want to read? This will save you loads and loads of time. So many businesses are churning out content, which is just utter garbage because nobody really cares. Either it's completely focused on themselves or it's about topics that nobody really cares about or it's written in a way that people will just never click on it. So think, is this engaging? Are you, is it the sort of thing that people will actually want to click on? If they do click on it, is it informative? Is it actually gonna improve their perception of your business because it gives them information? Is it shareable? Is this the sort of thing that people might want to share because they've got value from it? And finally, is this the sort of thing that other websites might like to post? Now, if it's none of those things, then it's probably a waste of time. Okay, so the next tip is to find some publications to reach out to. One of the things that we'll do inside content marketing is get our content 
published on other websites. Now, this can be particularly effective if you're looking to build thought leadership in your business. So for example, websites like Inc. Magazine or Entrepreneur will often allow guest authors to write posts that are important to them. This can be a great way of getting some visibility and also give you some credibility as it allows you to send these articles to your potential customers and there's a credibility attached from being featured on these websites. But in order to get guest author status on these sites, you have to have something useful to say. But even if you're not targeting these what we call top tier publications, there are always industry relevant publications which you can still get featured on. These can often be a lot easier to get featured on because obviously they don't have the huge volume of people that want to get featured on as like Forbes or Inc. magazine, but they can often have a very relevant target audience. So think about where do your audience spend their time learning about the thing that you do and getting their information? Maybe there are industry specific sites that they spend their time on. Maybe there are general interest sites, but they have an audience which is very close to your audience. Let's say, for example, that we wanted to get coverage for an architecture firm and that architecture firm wanted to get more leads. Well, we might look at things like Home Builder magazine. So if I just Google Home Builder magazine, we're going to see a whole bunch of magazines and all of these magazines will have websites which are full of content. And all of these sites, for example, this one, homebuilding.co.uk, imagine being the editor of this, you have to fill this with new information all the time. Let's say, for example, that we have an architect who wants to get featured on this site and contacts the editor and says, I've got an article all about some tips on how to reduce the cost of your build through clever architecture. Well, that might be something that this audience would find really compelling. So they might be able to just publish that information. Now, obviously, if you're going to want to get featured in these sorts of publications, you're going to have to have an outreach strategy. So tip number 19 is to build an outreach strategy that is based on your tenacity. So what you're going to do is you're going to go onto your target site, you're going to find a particular topic which you are particularly keen on. So let's say that you're, uh, you're, you're targeting green energy or something like that. And that's your that's your kind of space. Well, what you're going to then do is look at the authors behind the topics that you're relevant on. So here we've got Tim Pullen and Dusty Gedge. And what we're going to do is see if we can find their contact details and then reach out to them. So you will then research Tim and find out whether he is a writer for this publication or whether he is a guest writer. If he's a writer for this publication, then you're going to find his contact details either on Twitter or message him through LinkedIn and say, hey, we've got this idea for an article on home building. We notice you write about green. We've got an article which is all about, you know, five ways to make your new home more green, whatever. And you're going to do some outreach that way. Now, super secret top tip for outreach is you're going to need to be persistent. You're not going to get a yes from the first outreach attempt. Very rarely you'll get a yes from the first outreach attempt because the bigger the publication and the, the more outreach they're going to be subjected to on a daily basis. So you're going to need to follow up with them. You're going to need to usually send them at least two or three messages before you get a response. Okay, before we go into our final section, I just want to offer you some free help with your digital marketing. If you're looking to generate more leads through your website, then we have something which can really help you. It's called the free website and digital marketing review, and it's run by us here at Exposure Ninja. So if you go to ExposureNinja.com and click the button to request your free website and marketing review, we'll ask you for a bit of information about your business and your marketing goals. One of the consultancy team will then research your website, your current digital marketing, and also your space, your competitors, what you're up against. And they will put together a prioritized action plan that you can follow over the next six to 12 months to generate more leads through your website based on the goals that you've told us. This service is completely free of charge and it is totally awesome. So if you're considering working with an agency on this type of stuff and you have budget to actually put behind increasing your lead volume, then go to ExposureNinja.com to request your free website and digital marketing review today. Back on with the show. Next, we're going to talk about email marketing. Now, email marketing isn't the sexiest topic in digital marketing. I get that. But here's the thing. It really is sexy because it can generate you a lot of leads. Now, you've got people coming onto your website that are at different stages of the buyer journey. You've got people that are in the curiosity stage, right? So they're just curious, they're just having a look, they're just having a browse. You've got people that are in the research phase, so they're actually weighing up different options, trying to decide which one to choose. And then you've got people that are in the intent phase. Now, the people in the research and the commercial intent phase, those are the ones that are most likely to become leads. But the curiosity people, we can still do stuff with them. Now, they're probably not going to become a lead because they're not really ready for that yet. But if you can offer them something, you can offer them a free download, you can offer them a guide, something like that, which allows you to capture 
capture their email address, you can then put them into an automated email sequence which goes through a process of indoctrinating them and turning them into a lead when they are ready. Having an automated email sequence in the background doing this really helps you to get to 100 leads per day because the curiosity people, there's a very high volume of them. If you've got lots of blog post ranking for informational terms, you're gonna be getting a high volume of curiosity traffic. So being able to get these people and just put them on an automatic conveyor belt, which eventually turns them into leads further down the line, is gonna be really profitable for you because it can be very cheap to get curious traffic onto your site. It can be very expensive to get high commercial intent traffic onto your site. So tip number, 21 is to use lead magnets on your site. Now a lead magnet is the thing that you offer people in order to get them to give you their email address. So this might be a guide, it might be a downloadable. You'll notice on the Exposure Ninja website, for example, we'll often have a blog post about an informational topic and we'll offer a checklist as a free call to action. So people can just stick in their email address and request the checklist. Well, that's great for them because they're probably not ready to become a lead for a digital marketing agency yet. But if we give them the checklist, we then send them some some videos, we give them some more stuff which helps them to get to know us and understand what we do, then later on down the line, they can become a lead. But without that lead magnet, we never would have got their email address in the first place. Again, we've got other videos on lead magnets, so we'll link to some of them somewhere. <laughs> Tip number 22 with your emails is to test different approaches to find out what gets the best open rate and the best engagement rate. Most people approach email marketing in a really weird way. They go into this broadcast commercial mode where they feel like they have to talk in a certain language and it has to be really boring and corporate. The approach that we found works best with email marketing is actually to have a figurehead for the business and to, for them to talk in a very personable and one-on-one -on -one way. Really talking to a massive audience is just talking to an individual person. So understanding who your customer is and then sending out emails which are designed to talk to one person rather than a massive list. Again, we've got another video about how to do this. Tip number 23 is to use automated email sequences based on behavioral triggers. Huh? Right. Here's what I mean by this. If somebody is interested in a particular service that you offer, you wanna send them emails about that service. If someone indicates that they're at a particular stage in their buyer journey, you wanna send them stuff that's relevant to that particular stage. Now, whichever email platform you're using will have a different way of doing this. And really it's beyond the scope of this video to explain how this all works. But let me just take you through Exposure Ninja as an example, so I can explain how we do this in our business. We have two email streams. When you become an email lead of Exposure Ninja, we will analyze whether you are doing your own digital marketing or whether you're looking for agency help. That will define which of these email streams that you go on and each of them will be targeted at that particular person. So for example, if you're doing your own digital marketing, you're gonna get tips about how to implement. If you're using an agency, then you're gonna get tips on strategy and bigger picture things because you're at very different stages in your business. But even beyond that, if you then become a lead of Exposure Ninja, we're gonna send you information about how to choose an agency, what does good look like, what what should you expect from an agency and that type of thing because you've now indicated that you have commercial intent and you're moving into the intent stage of the buyer journey. Now all of these things are triggered by your activity so it'll be the things that you click on the website or the options that you choose in a form on our website and that defines your experience with the email marketing. Now many businesses just have one email list and they just send broadcasts to that list and everyone gets the same thing regardless of whether they're a customer or they're a lead or whether they're at the very top of the funnel. This is okay, it's better than nothing, but really it's not optimal because it doesn't speak to people where they're at. So if you wanna get more hardcore with your email marketing, of course we have more videos on this and you can check them out on our channel. Now we have three more tips in this video and they are all about organic social media. Now, yes, sure, the days of reaching hundreds and thousands of people on Facebook organically are probably over, but that doesn't mean that organic social media doesn't have a place. Now tip number 24, a great way to build engagement on your social social channels is to run contests. And you can use various platforms like Raffle Copter to run contests which require people to sign up or to share or to engage with your posts in order to enter. These can be great because they can help give your page visibility outside its immediate followers. Every time someone shares, obviously your page is then seen by other people. And by sharing, they're kind of implying an endorsement. If the contest has 
The key here is to give away something in the contest which is actually relevant to your business. Yes, you can get loads of engagement by giving away an iPad or whatever, but unless that traffic is massively relevant to your business and your business is all about iPads, then the chance of those people actually being relevant to your company might be quite small. Tip number 25 is in the face of declining organic reach on most of the platforms, consider adding a small boost to your posts on say Facebook just to increase their visibility. Often you'll find that the boost amount doesn't need to be much. It can be a few pounds depending on the size of your audience or it can be 10, 15, 20 pounds, whatever. But if you've put the time into creating the post and creating the content behind the post, then adding a small amount of boost can really help to give you a bit more visibility. Tip number 26 is about how you engage with your audience across social. We've seen a rise over the last few years of brands actually adopting a human-like personality which reflects their target audience. For example, the most engagement on a single tweet ever at the moment is this Burger King tweet where Kanye West tweeted, McDonald's is my favorite restaurant. Burger King simply tweeted, explains a lot. It's the most engaged tweet of all time. And the reason is because Burger King adopted a personality, right? Burger King wasn't afraid to give a little dig to Kanye West. By treating social media as a conversation platform rather than just a broadcast thing where you just ram stuff down people's throats, you're much more likely to get some engagement. Most individuals get Get very little engagement on social media at all. So it doesn't take much for you to really activate people by engaging with them, by replying, by liking their messages. This can give people a real boost. You know, if you've spent your whole time tweeting to no one and all of a sudden a company says, yeah, do you know what? This is great. Or thanks for sharing something like that. It can give you a good day. Okay. So that covers a very extensive list of ways to get to hundred leads per day. Remember, you're not going to get to hundred leads per day immediately. And that's probably a good thing because you need a huge back office and you need the processing power to be able to deal with those leads. Let us know in the comments, what are you going to be implementing immediately? And what do you think your biggest challenges are going to be getting to this goal? I hope you've learned something today, but if you haven't, then I hope you've at least enjoyed this. Drop us a like and consider subscribing. Also, let us know in the comments, what are you going to be implementing in your digital marketing strategy as a result? And don't forget, visit ExposureNinja.com forward slash review to request your free website and digital marketing review if you want help getting to 100 leads per day. This is exactly what we do for our clients. Until next time, see you soon.